Uh, what now, America? This is Think Tech OI. I'm Jay Fidel, standing in for Tim Apicella. He's on travel. And we're talking today in What Now, America about, um, about Mike Pence, <clears throat> about title Pence Speaks about January 6th. And he says that Trump is wrong. Um, he distances himself from Trump. What does this mean? Winston, what does this mean? Oh, Winston Welch, Cynthia Sinclair, and Karen Buzzard. Okay, welcome to the show, you guys. Aloha. Aloha. Winston, yeah. what does this mean when Pence gets up and says this? And I thought he was a Trumper, but maybe not. And maybe he's more an anti-Trumper these days than he ever was. What do you think? I'm not sure I would ever put Mike Pence in the category of anti-Trumper. He towed the line so uh, as such an uh, obedient, um, <laughs> well, uh, vice president, let's just say, um, uh, didn't say anything about any egregious action the entire time. Although apparently there were, you know, behind the scenes things where he said, oh, I can't. I can't in good conscience bear this man's actions or words uh, leading up to the election even, but for whatever reason, he decided to, um, let's not say turn the other cheek, but uh, go for a, a different political reality. And that seems to be what he's doing now. Now, I, I, I don't want to be cynical, but it doesn't seem that uh, he, just the slightest sort of wording that says, someone may have been wrong in his interpretation of the constitution um mm -hmm. is is pretty milk toast but the uh the media was all over because it was the first real indication from this man after a year that he's he's realized uh and willing to say publicly and and it's an it's a coordinated effort because it's followed up rather immediately by uh mitch mcconnell which i was actually that that was actually more meaningful for me but uh both of them taken together i think show the beginnings that there is a significant portion of what we used to consider to be the Republican Party or, the, or that, that calls itself the Republican Party that that says we have to um, shut ourselves of this um, uh, fealty to well, you're, say, you're saying this is one of those points of light that give us a pause to think that maybe the Republican Party is changing to a more responsible party. Are you, are you saying that? It sounds it is more like um, when a car turns you know driving down the street and then it turns for a second and you think oh there's a car coming at me it was just turning the corner um and so maybe we'll see what happens if it keeps going down that road and shines the light more but i honestly you know with with mitch mcconnell what did he he was very clear yesterday or it, it might have been the day before but by this time where he said let's make no mistake about that this was an insurrection designed to uh, stop us from uh, you know carrying out basic legitimate functions and overthrow the election and and I think that was you know he said that right after the coup or the insurrection on January 6 and so it's like uh, you know a, a broken clock is right twice a day so in this case kind of the broken speaker or uh, house uh, Senate minority leader is right twice. <laughs> <laughs> a year or so given about a year later that he's willing to stand up and say this but i think there's probably been so much in internally where people have come up to him and, and said hey dude we need a shield here and and the donald doesn't like you anyway you're already on his his um naughty list so why don't you stand up and say this so that at least we can have some cover when we go back home to whatever districts that we're in where they are moderate district where their people really want to go back to a principled republican party that's not based on personality and say let's run on principles and i think that's what this is going towards and i think yeah it may be this daylight and who knows what's going to be coming out in the next few weeks or months with the january 6th well, uh, nobody it, knows what's going to happen honestly. not a lot but let's just assume that the republicans themselves are um are deciding that there's a, a fair faction of them that and i've been saying this a while that they they just that they're they've been waiting for some cover like this to come out and to stand up and when he said you know this is we don't need to go after liz cheney or, or, or adam kitzinger this is wrong this is not what the, the party that we're about and we need to, to say this and and so did mitt romney uh by the way uh who was the standard bearer a few years ago of course it's his niece that that wrote the um 
uh, you know, but these are little points of light. But, these are little points of light. They you are. Know, Cynthia, there's, there's two vectors working here, you know. One is the, the points of light that Winston is talking about. Um, I guess that would include the, uh, this is only legitimate political discourse that the GOP unanimously adopted in its, um, in its sanctions, uh, its, its rejection, its exclusion of um, Liz Cheney and Adam Kiss, Kiss, Kinziger. Um, but at the same time, there's vectors going the other way, um, vectors which, uh, which you know, uh, various governors are adopting, Republican governors and legislate, legislatures. There's a, a whole movement in the country to reject any um, you know, vaccine mandates or mask mandates, and they're, they're politically driven. You, you could not change my mind about that. They're politically driven, clearly. So these two vectors are working um, and we are going to see how they play. And you can think that these points of light will prevail, um, but you can also think that these um, uh, politicization of every issue you can think of uh, in favor of the Trump position, that that would prevail. Uh, so what are your thoughts about which one will prevail? Are these points of light persuasive to you? Those points of light were not at all persuasive to me. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> I noticed over and over and over <clears throat> that not even one single place where I looked in the news or listened um, <laughs> mentioned the fact that Pence might have been doing this to cover his own back. He um, tried to see if it was okay to turn everything over. He didn't mention that in that speech, right? How many months did he spend seeing if he could do it <laughs> instead of just coming right out and saying that's not constitutional, I can't do it. So I think this is more about Pence trying to um, just to cover up his own stuff and and possibly pave a way going forward for him. He well wants run for president and this is what we'll do oh my god that i don't know why but i think i just had some gas um you know you know cynthia, cynthia um you know we have been talking here on this show uh, for a long time about the possibility that the republican party will will see the light um <laughs> now forgetting pence for a minute even forgetting uh, mitch mcconnell's comment um, is, is there a possibility now, from all that we know, uh, that the Republican Party is seeing the light? I don't see it. Um, Liz Cheney is quoted as saying that the Republican Party has to make a choice. We can either be loyal to our Constitution or loyal to Donald Trump, but we cannot be both. And I think that's a very appropriate statement to make. And I think every Republican needs to ask themselves a bunch of questions. Because right now, if you're going to be loyal to Donald Trump, you have to remember that he's facing criminal and civil charges all over the place. Criminal charges in Georgia, uh, that trying to create election fraud, conspiracy to commit election fraud, uh, uh, conf uh, with elections, criminal, wait, sorry, it's not all the way on there, criminal solicitation. And then we've got the New York civil charges, which are tax fraud, mortgage fraud, bank fraud, it goes on. Then we've got New York criminal charges. We've got tax fraud, insurance fraud, scheme to defraud, and falsifying business records. If any Republican, any Republican can still follow this plan, then they need to not even have have any kind of position in politics you mean you mean that it would be irrational i mean and of course we have seen our fair share of irrationality haven't we okay so um you know you know you know you know what comes to mind when you set out all those charges it's uh, the answer of the the standard republican answer it's it goes this way i hope i can do this right yeah 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 it's all a big witch hunt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Karen, you're a media person. Does this make a bit of difference? Is all these charges against him? I mean, there have been so many politicians in this country, in these United States, who have been convicted, gone to jail, come back, won elections. It doesn't seem to bother the public uh, when a demagogue goes to jail. 
Uh, do you think it's really bothering the public now, all these charges that Cynthia has recited? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem, I don't see any evidence of it bothering the public. Uh, I do see some evidence that uh, maybe that there might be some interest in Trump running as a substitute for, um, you know, maybe that's what he's opening the door for himself as a presidential nominee. Uh, because uh, I think there, from what I had heard on a PBS uh, special, uh, I think it was Frontline, in fact, that um, the reason they delayed calling out the National Guard was because uh, Trump was still in power and they were afraid that he would use it for his own purposes. So I think there is some behind the scenes, even though we may not always be aware of it, some realization that uh, there needs to be some control of Trump, even if it's not publicly expressed. What does control mean? Imprisonment? Uh, imprisonment, making sure he does not get back in office again. If you remember, even the military generals had concocted a plan to make sure uh, he didn't have control over um, the uh, forces to use them against citizens in the US. On a scale of one to 10, what's your level of confidence that they would reject him a second time? 50-50. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so Winston, you know, uh, what you know? What difference does it make? Uh, is Trump really, um, uh, you know, uh, cruising to to a disaster for him, or or is you know? You remember the line about uh, just spell my name right? He's still a very popular guy. He doesn't have Twitter, but you know, you hear about him every five minutes, and um, a lot of people still swear by him. And uh, it's it's not clear at all to me that any of this is really damaging his prospects with them. Um, what about you? Uh, do you do you feel that um, he would be a viable candidate in 2024? Well, it, it, you know, Donald Trump and Trumpism isn't going anywhere. Uh, I mean, to say that it's not disappearing, it's 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 um, it's taken root in our society. It's at it's everywhere. We see this, and I think that what the appeal is somehow on some level, and we're going to be dissecting this for for the hundred years is uh, what does it really represent when you try and get down to the core of it? I don't have a lot of good answers. I, uh, there's from everything from you know mass hypnosis to just uh, a basic distrust of American government that's gone on for, for centuries. Uh, it, it's, or elitism, it's, 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 it's a whole, it's a people losing their jobs, it's society changing, it's America changing, it's all of that uh, and much more, but it's not going away. Um, in fact, I think it's 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 the Hydra. You know, it doesn't matter if Donald Trump is the president or not. He has acolytes that are much uh, more willing to step up in across the board. But we're also seeing people standing up and saying, uh, "No, that's that's not it." I saw, saw Joe Manchin said that there's uh, that uh, what 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 was uh, the exact words that he said that uh, uh, electoral count act reform will absolutely pass so these senators and and uh, and congress uh, folks realize that we can't have these fiascos of, of everybody suing all the time and trying to figure out does the vice president have the ability to overturn this and, and whatnot so it's in their interest as well just to not have chaos and i think mitch mcconnell has recognized that you had susan collins coming out and saying something not we would expect that from susan collins and also uh, you know lisa murkowski but those are those are outliers and they always have been however every voice makes a difference there and when you look at the polls internally support for donald trump is still very high uh, amongst republicans it's like over 40 percent approve of him and what he's done and said and how it, they they ignore his behavior uh somehow they turned a blind eye to it but when you ask the same people do you want him to be running in uh 2024 the answer is different they say 
he's come, he's done his work, he's going to work from behind the scenes, he's going to raise a lot of money, he's still going to be a kingmaker, but uh, basic, and we and we'll kowtow to him to different degrees, you're still not seeing a lot of breakaway from the the, the Rubios and the Cruises and the uh, and a lot of other people that No, might. they're afraid of him, they're afraid of him. And what's more, I think his influence, your point is well taken, his influence is growing, and look at what's happening in Canada over the politicization of public health extraordinary the whole country is in a not about it um and it's canada i thought those guys were more rational than we but when not. you look at canada though that i mean a lot of that is uh, it's uh they're connected at the hip to america and it's so. for not to spill over but the uh when you really dig down in there well there may be deep-seated resentment against some things about the vaccine mandates uh, they're getting a lot of money from abroad. And when you look at, at, at some, if you actually do the reading in there, um, you know, nobody likes to be imprisoned in their house and, and, and restrictions that we've had from COVID. These are a public nest necessity that we are now deciding whether or not we still need to keep them. Let's not forget COVID deaths yesterday or this week are at a year high. Um, well, we have but, a million people in this country pretty but soon. This, I mean, right this I, week. Now they're going down, certainly, hopefully, but who knows what's coming down. Uh, the well, you have another mutation and bingo. Um, so, you know, I, I was I was talking to these guys uh, before you got on the, um, you know, the meeting, Cynthia, and telling them about the election of 1896. Uh, this was a um, this was a contention between the populist movement, William Jennings Bryan, uh, you like history, right? Uh, and um, and uh, McKinley, William McKinley. Um, and um, uh, the populist movement was the hinterland. It was the rural parts of America that were very resentful of the capital concentrations in New York and elsewhere in the cities. They felt that uh, those guys were pushing them into poverty. They were responsible uh, for all these business cycles and and uh, all the, the angst and trouble that the middle America had. Um, and so this was a big attempt of, a, of a, a movement that had been growing for 20, 30 years uh, to unseat um, the capital concentrations in New York. You know, the, the Pierpont Morgans and the Carnegies and um, the railroads and the steel and all that. <clears throat> and um, we of the country really thought that the populist movement would win but it lost because money talks. Citizens United talks, okay? The, the difference between that election and the elections coming now is that in those days and ever since until, until Trump, there was a peaceful transition of power. Now that is at issue. So my question to you is, um, assuming that we have the same kind of bifurcation of the country, it's a similar kind of division of the country now, but assuming also that we have lots of confusion and lots of contention about who won, that whether the count was right, whether there, whether you know, it, whether the public, you know, could properly vote with confidence in the system whether the courts would respect that. Um, what do you think is going to happen this year, eight months away? Oh, <clears throat> that's a big ask. Because <laughs> things seem to change every day. And if we can have some sort of, um, you know, accountability happen with some of these people that have broken the law, so egregiously broken the law, then maybe things will will change and come around. Um, and, and I think people will start falling away from that whole scene of um, that Donald Trump has been, you know, sort of leading forward. I know that the DHS just put out a statement yesterday on the domestic terrorism threat. That's part of this whole thing, right? And it says the United States remains in a heightened threat environment fueled by several factors, including an online environment filled with false or misleading narratives and conspiracy theories and other forms of mis or dis and, mal and mal information or MDM introduced and or amplified by foreign and domestic threat actors. As long as we've got that at this 
at this level, I think that there's there's no way to know for sure and there's no way to change any of it. So um, I think that that's going to make a big difference. Going what about what about the uh, as Winston mentioned? What about the select committee? Um, they're giving us um, you know pieces of what they've learned. It appears in the newspaper. Uh, they're about to start live hearings on live TV. It's okay. going to be something like the McCarthy hearings, maybe or uh, Watergate. You know, um, it's going to be a public uh, spasm over this. Um, and so uh, things are going to come out that are shocking. They've already come out that are shocking. We're going to find out that he was that Trump was engaged in a real live conspiracy, that he was the center of it, um, that he was uh, attempting to uh, manipulate the, the votes, the evidence. He was thinking of doing violence with the National Guard and the military in general. I mean, it was a whole nine yards. He was I think that's going to come out. And we're all going to hear about it, and the and the four of us are going to be outraged beyond outrage about it. But other people, maybe in the middle of the country, um, the Trump followers, they're not going to be outraged. They're either not going to believe it, or they're going to believe it and say, eh, so what? Uh, he was just trying to hold on to his seat. Um, do you think that what comes out of that, even assuming the worst of it, the most horrendous conspiracy and military coup and um, violation of every principle and every rule in the Constitution is going to make a difference in this election? I hope so. And like I said, accountability is, I mean, did you ask me that? Was that yes. funny? Um, I, I hope so. And I think that it's, again, accountability. And if we don't have it, then it, nothing's going to change and there will be no difference. And yes, that same twisted mentality will still reign in these people's minds until they realize that their thinking was wrong and they realize that they were falling for a lot of misinformation. Until we can do something about this misinformation, nothing is going to change. And that's, in my mind, the very most important thing that we need to try to address. Well, that's a great segue to you, Karen. Um, misinformation, disinformation, social media, and the failure of what you might consider the legitimate media, uh, media to address this, to cover it, to speak truth to power, to make it clear to all of us what's going on. Are they doing a good job or are they, or are they pulling the rug out from under us? No, I don't think they're doing a particularly good job. Uh, I think that um, they are really not uh, presenting what the uh, American public needs to know. And there's still a lot of, um, splintering of the news channels to different seg you know they're not uh, fully covering things and they cover things you know at a specific angles that you know uh, like uh, even i think this uh, russian conflict with uh, ukraine is being covered in a biased way but i think there's a um distrust of the media but one thing i did hear was an interview which i thought was very interesting with brad Raffensperger or whatever his name was, the Secretary of State of Georgia. And he said in the Georgia election, most people did not vote for Biden or Trump. They voted down ballot. They didn't want they didn't want anything to do with national politics. They just voted for local politicians. And I think it would be interesting to see if that was true, you know, else in other states, because I think that's really where the hope lies is the down ballot ticket or the local elections because people are very discouraged, I think, at the national level with the um, basically the Senate and the House, you know, basically are kind of checkmating each other. So there's no action on anything. People just get, you know, fed up with it. So I think that the real action needs to be at the local level for the parties at this stage or for the Democratic Party. Yeah, and Heron, and what you're saying is that the the parties, and I'm speaking now of the Democratic Party, has lost its its ability, its mojo, its its uh, togetherness uh, to to deal with what's happening. This is an yeah. opportunity for them to lead, to galvanize, and they're not doing it. No, I mean, uh, I think that to see it as a uh, the last election as purely about um, Trump or Biden. It's possibly a mistake. I think it was just a disillusion with national politics. So a lot of people, at least in Georgia, according to them, didn't vote for either of the top candidates. They just 
they had more people voting down ballot than they had people voting for either the top ticket people. You know, Winston, I want to go around for last comments, but I want to ask you a question too, though, and you can go beyond it if you want. Um, and that is, um, so we've seen these points of light. We've seen, um, you know, some of these statements made recently, but, but um, largely the GOP is in lockstep. And I just wonder, you know, what it would take, A, to have more defections, a la Cheney and Kinzinger, um, we don't really see that. We see a, a few comments, but nothing like a mass defection. What would it take um, to generate a mass defection? Um, and B, would a mass defection, how would a mass defection work? How would it affect, how would it affect the uh, elections coming soon? Oh, well, you, you know, people are waking up, Jay. They're, they're sick of the rancor, as Karen was saying, that they're, they're tired of not being able to talk to their family and their friends and their colleagues about just normal stuff where we used to be able to joke about, um, you know, well, you're, you're liberal, that's why you support that, or, or, you know, you're conservative. And so, but these days it's become, we're so manipulated as uh, I think Cynthia was mentioning about when well, you're talking about the legit, legitimate news. I mean, what's the, our, our, our newspaper, which I, I find a reasonable newspaper has about what, 150,000 people it goes out to in our state population of 1.5 million. The legitimate news in these days is TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, their friends. And, and if you see it on there, and they have so finely manipulated us uh, to put us in little echo chambers and to feed us whatever narrative is that we think that we want to hear or that we don't even know that we want to hear because it's so subconscious that they're, they're pressing buttons based on something we pressed of two likes or whatever. And uh, and they're very sophisticated. And, and you know this if you shop on Amazon, if you buy, you know, double A batteries and, uh, you know, a, some a, a glue, a glue stick, then they know that you want to buy Kansas City steaks. I, I don't know. They got really sophisticated algorithms. We're just data, aren't we? We're just data. We're, data. we're just no, data. We're, we're manipulata uh, manipulatable. Uh, that's not a word. Uh, point, people who then vote or don't vote, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. So. It basically, it's just getting back out there and rediscovering our humanity, our common interest. These politicians will discover when they go back home in Peoria, people are sick of the rancor. They're sick of the division. They just want the job done. And they're tired of Do they understand, as opposed to what Karen care. was saying, that they got to participate in the national conversation? So um, I think Karen's maybe right in there. I mean, they're really, it's just about locally. Do, do you think that Mitch McConnell has you on speed dial? Does he care? No. Uh, but your neighbors, those are the ones you're going to go to if uh, if you need something. And I, yeah. I don't know, you remember the olden days when your mom used to send you next door for an egg or a, a cup of milk when she was baking something? When was the last time you went to your neighbors to borrow an egg? Um, maybe we need to start the borrow an egg uh, campaign across the country so that we get to know our neighbors again as just normal human beings. That uh, but it's gone the other way. Cynthia, I, I'd like you to uh, deal with this. Uh, it's a, it, you know, ideally it's a national conversation, but but it's not, as Karen said. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, I guess the question is, uh, um, it, this, you know, it's, it strikes me that this is a kind of reality show it's all theatrics, uh, and I hate to use the word propaganda here in these United States, but it's, it is largely that, social media and the like, and um, these political officials get up and, and they're really playing to the House, they're playing to the National House. It's almost like the delegation doesn't have that much to say about it, and local government doesn't get involved, and local people don't really care. They think it's beyond them, or the, as, they, as Karen said, they're tired of it. But it gets worse because it's not only a, uh, a reality show for the country, it's a reality show for the world. You know, uh, I, I, it was Putin or somebody commenting on what Putin was doing to say that Biden's future depends on what he does, how well he succeeds in Ukraine. And if he fails in Ukraine, he will never be able to live, live up to it. He will, he will be done politically. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I like your opinion about that. But that does demonstrate that this echo chamber is not limited to a, a conversation within our borders. 
This is a global conversation and, if, and it affects the politics within our borders. Do you agree? I do. I absolutely agree. I believe that there has been a lot of reporting on the rise in um, in dictators and autocrats, and it's like everywhere. And so maybe what Putin's doing is for that very reason, because we know that he has been focused on destroying America, tearing us apart. He's been focused on that for a long, long time. And he's also said he wants Ukraine back in Russia. He wants to reunite the Soviet Union. He has said that from day one. And he's also said that he wants to destabilize America since day one. Those are two things that tell me we know why he's doing what he's doing right now on the border in Ukraine. And yes, it is important how Biden handles this and how the world handles this. You know, we see, uh, you know, uh, President Macron going and talking to him at the end of the 30 foot table, you know, and you wonder how intimate are these discussions when they're 30 feet apart. Well, why are they bilateral? Why is it just one leader going to see him? Yes. Um, why, why isn't there a crowd from the EU and from NATO going to see him? That's very, that's very troubling. Thank you. Um, that was my next thing that I was just going to say. And why is he there all by himself? Yeah. Now, Exactly what I was going to say. And, and so I feel that that is so important for NATO to stand together right now um, for, for America's sake and for the world also, for dem democracy all around the world, right? Yeah. So we know that accountability is the most important thing, in my mind anyway, and I believe it is the number one barrier wall from being able to make any kind of progress. Uh, we get the misinformation tells us, oh, he's not really guilty. Well, we need to find out the proof that shows that he is. And until we have that, so I think the January 6th committee, it's really important. I want to, can, is it closing time? Can I do more closing? It is closing time, but go take another 30 seconds. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> okay, well, this is the newest thing that's come out from January 6th and from other places too, and that is the National Archives and Records Administration, NARA, said it ret retrieved 15 boxes of White House records and other items that were stored in Mar-a-Lago. So there is a, an act, the Presidential Records Act of 1978, that says they cannot take anything away or destroy anything. So we've got um, we've got Daniel Goldman, who is the guy who was the, re the he was the um, lawyer. Impeachment, in yeah. Lawyers. So he said, this is a crime and would be pretty easy to prove with a few grand jury subpoenas to witness of his document destruction. You know, you know what I say to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another, another part of the witch hunt. You know? but wait, this is the important thing that comes out of that. In section B of that act, it says whoever does that is disqualified from holding any office under the United States. Oh, very good. Good. <laughs> so, good. Hold that thought. Yeah. Hold that thought and see. And, you know, easy to prove. Let's do it. So all this other stuff is so hard to prove and we have to go against all these other things. Well, they're already trying to disqualify this guy, uh, Madison Cawley, I think, or Cawley Madison, um, on the basis of the 14th Amendment, Section 3. So this is going to be a big thing in the courts going forward. So, Karen, I have to ask you a question again about public opinion uh, to close, and then you can make any statement you want. Okay. Um, if you know, we know that public opinion is formed not only by these media that we've been talking about, but also by entertainment. And a lot of people in the time of COVID sit at home and watch, you know, cable TV, and they watch what's being offered. It strikes me that there's an awful lot of material out there these days about what happened to Germany in the 30s. Um, you know, the Nazi movies are, um, are they're proliferated all through cable entertainment um, and various other examples of um, outrage, of uh, human rights, uh, of atrocities, uh, of dictators. It's just a lot of stuff. 
Um, and I wonder if you think this affects people. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of movies out there with violence and vengeance. And we know this helps. We, I mean, I know anyway, this helps establish public opinion. So you have various things coming over the entertainment and people don't watch the news nearly as much. And the news is not as persuasive, persuasive at some emotional level as all this entertainment. <clears throat> How is this affecting public opinion today? In other words, for accepting violence, but also for showing what happens in case you get picked up at two o'clock in the morning because you didn't part your hair correctly. <laughs> uh, well, I think... Uh... In terms of my view of the movies, I think Hollywood made a huge error, in my opinion, going to these Marvel comic superheroes, whether it's good versus, it simplifies the world, good versus evil. And it seems like that's all they know how to produce anymore with the, um, you know, those special effects. I've got the CSG or whatever they're called, uh, which to me are horrid. And they don't seem to able to produce movies about ordinary people. You have to actually watch foreign movies to see dramas about people and their relationships. And it's like they've forgotten that, you know, we can have relationships in this country. It's all about these fantasy heroes and uh, evil people. And I think that does affect um, splitting the world into good versus evil. Even with this uh, affair with Putin, I don't think it's, you know, us good, them evil. <laughs> it's much more complicated than that. But I think there's a tendency in the press to portray it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're out of time, but Winston, uh, simply because uh, uh, you're in the minority of gender here among the three of um, uh, guests, I, I'm going to allow you one more, one more close. With, with apologies to Cynthia and Karen. Okay, <laughs> you can, but you can uh, sort of summarize all this if you can, and 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 say welcome back to Cynthia and welcome to Karen and Absolutely. whatever else you like. Welcome to uh, to Cynthia and Karen. Exactly. Uh, you know, the title of the show was that there's some daylight being um, spread between Mike Pence, who was so, so close and so uh, involved in this, whether at, at good, bad or otherwise, Mitch McConnell and other leaders and spokespeople, the, the old guard of the party that are starting to speak up. People are sick of the rancor. They're sick of the noise. I think candidates that there's going to be cert certainly those that inflame that and people that want to join in on the drama bag uh, wagon, but there's a huge number of people that are just tired of it. They're sick of the they're sick of COVID. They're sick of Donald Trump. They're sick of the Congress. They're sick of uh, Donald Trump, good boy, good bad or otherwise. They just want to go back to having normalish sort of relationships. And I think the 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 candidates that reflect that. Um, are going to continue to be uh, rising in the ascendant. I think we have uh, good hope here. Uh, it's the slow turtle. The noise is not going to go away. The basic underlying things about Trumpism is not going to go away. We need to address those uh, as we change as a nation and try and figure out what that means. But for right now, I would say keep the slow, steady going so that we can get back to normalcy. Okay, I, and I just want to, in closing, I want to thank you all, uh, Winston, Cynthia, Karen. I also want to tell you that um, at the beginning of Trump's administration, the play Hamilton opened on Broadway. And um, in that play, if you recall, they criticized Trump. And so he refused to go and made some stinko comments about it. Um, Pence, however, went. Um, and of course, uh, he was recognized by the audience and uh, they came to ask him for a comment. And his comment was completely different than Trump. His comment was, uh, you know, I'm into the First Amendment. Um, this is a wonderful play. This examines our democratic roots. And uh, I, I, mean, I don't feel the same way that Trump feels about this play. And, and he distinguished himself even early on. I'm not saying that he's been a good vice president or a protector of our, of our nation, but he is different than Trump. And maybe there are other people in there too that are different and can break away if only they had the opportunity. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Karen. See you next time. Aloha. Aloha.